Welcome to the ADR Podcasts, where we interview diverse movers and shakers and innovative change makers. With me today is David B. Grinberg, a strategic communications expert, brand ambassador, and featured blogger with 25 years of work experience. Welcome, David. Oh, thank you, Deborah. I really appreciate you having me on. It's a pleasure. Oh, well, my pleasure, too. Tell us a little bit about those 25 years worth of experience. I'm sure our audience will be interested to hear this. Okay, sure. Well, um, the main work experience actually began in college at the University of Maryland, where I was studying journalism as an undergrad. And during that time, I also worked full-time for the college newspaper, which is a nationally recognized, independent, award-winning um, daily college newspaper. And I worked as the editorial page editor and also an award-winning columnist. Uh, I was very fortunate back then to win some writing awards from the Society of Professional Journalists and Rolling Stone Magazine. And that experience served as a springboard to what happened next. Uh, and because of you know, my main interest, not only in journalism, but politics and public affairs, part of my minor in political science, it required a uh, internship on Capitol Hill. And I aimed for the top because I think it's important to have big goals. And I really liked the the, the uh, majority leader of the House of Representatives at the time, who was Congressman Richard Gephardt of St. Louis. So I applied to work there in the office of the House Majority Leader in the U.S. Capitol building. A few things that are noteworthy. One is no one thought I would get the job, which goes to show you can't listen to the naysayers. And the reason is because I'm not from St. Louis. I have no connections to St. Louis. My family uh, were not big political donors, et cetera, et cetera. So there was no reason for, uh, for me to think that this was a job I could get. But again, one of my mottos is, if you never try, you'll never know what might have been. And this is where the newspaper connection came in. Because despite what I just said, unknowing to me, Congressman Gephardt's administrative assistant at the time, who was in charge of hiring, was a University of Maryland graduate. So big coincidence, which means he was very familiar with the college newspaper, et cetera. And uh, although I have no proof of it, I think that helped me get my foot in the door there. And that was a, a transformational experience because I got to work with people like George Stephanopoulos, who's a household name now. Back then, no one knew how to spell his name, so that was kind of interesting. Now he's a household name. And uh, that job led to my next one, which was working for uh, Stanley Greenberg and Celinda Lake, who were progressive political pollsters and strategists. For instance, um, they helped on the presidential campaign of Nelson Mandela when he became president of South Africa. And uh, they worked on, on the Clinton presidential campaign. So I had become uh, very interested in Bill Clinton while I was in college. He just really struck a chord with me. I, I believed in his main message of, of helping the middle class grow and prosper. And uh, coincidentally, uh, Stanley Greenberg, this Democratic pollster, became the chief pollster for the Clinton for President campaign. And other people I had worked with, like George Stephanopoulos, he also got involved. So all the stars started to align, which was very interesting, because sometimes when you set big goals and put your mind to it and focus like a laser beam, sometimes you get lucky and the stars just align and fall into place. So that's what happened. So I ended up working on the Clinton for President campaign. And obviously he won, 
that led to an assignment at the Presidential Transition Office, the Department of Personnel, where I focused on uh, recruiting people for public affairs jobs, communications, media relations, at uh, all the agencies government-wide, political appointees. And then that moved to the White House after inauguration to the Office of Presidential Personnel, where I continued those same duties of recruiting people uh, for the agencies, government-wide political appointees, Schedule C, they're called. And uh, that led to a political appointment at the Office of Management and Budget OMB, which is also sometimes referred to as the White House Budget Office. So that is how I got uh, there. And uh, you know, I could certainly answer any questions or if you wanted to ask anything about that, or I could keep up moving on with my experience. Uh, well, just tell us for uh, a brief moment some of the crises that you handled while you were in the White House? Okay, well, keep in mind, first of all, this job um, was straight out, out of college, more or less, so I was very young. <laughs> I was in my you know, early 20s, so um, I wasn't a decision maker, per se, but I was working with a lot of decision makers, people like George Stephanopoulos and, and Leon Panetta, who was then the, the White House budget director, the director of OMB, before he became chief of staff. So there were a, a bunch of crises that occurred um, back then, the biggest of which was the president's budget plan, because in those early days, the president was under attack for um, a, a bunch of minor scandals and things weren't really going well. And the media focused um, everything on the president getting his 1993 budget passed Congress, which was called the Budget Reconciliation Act of 1993, which called for major deficit reduction to basically eliminate the budget deficit, which eventually happened. So this was a do or die situation and uh, Long story short, the bill ended up passing in the Senate, but it was a 50-50 vote. That's how close it was. And in a 50-50 vote in the Senate, the vice president cast the tie-breaking vote. So Vice President Gore cast, cast the tie-breaking vote for that to, uh, to pass. But prior to that, for instance, now we, we've heard of this term in politics, war rooms. Well, this term war room grew out of the Clinton campaign and it carried over to the White House. And, and what war room means is really a rapid response team that works basically around the clock. And that's what happened um, for this uh, to pass, to, to get this bill passed. There was a so-called war room set up with about 30 people worked very long hours, and it involved a range of things such as outreach to, to members of Congress, outreach to the media, outreach to uh, stakeholders and advocacy organizations, to the, the general public, basically a full throttle effort to gain as much support as possible because the media was portraying this uh, bill as um, being central to the administration's success. And if it didn't pass, the media was portraying it as the end of the Clinton presidency. So it's a bit of media sensationalism. So with your so, wonderful experience in these war rooms, dealing with long hours and incredible number of um, media markets and, and personnel, well, let's, Let's go now to your work that was not political, but still very intense as you worked with crises that were either natural disasters or like 9-11. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, let me just, just before transitioning, say there were some other minor uh, 
you know, or minor or major crises back in those early Clinton years. I'm not going to get into them, but just to name them, there, there were uh, the Midwest floods at the time, mm -hmm. which uh, was a big crisis. There was NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Act. And, uh, you know, those took up a lot of time as well. But following um, my work at the White House, you know, basically, if you're working as a political appointee, especially if you're young, there's some considerations that come to the forefront after you do this for a year or two. Number one of which, of which is you have to have no job security long term and you're not covered by any of the civil service uh, benefits or rules, laws, regulations that career uh, federal employees fall under. But I, I became um, a bit disenchanted with um, with the president, unfortunately, after he had that you know, well-publicized um, scandal incident with Monica Lewinsky. So that coupled with the fact that I was looking you know, to move on and for something more permanent, I sought out a job at the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is responsible for enforcing the anti-discrimination laws in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And that was a career civil servant job. And uh, again, I worked in media relations there as um, a national media spokesman, dealing with um, a number of crises, the biggest of which, coincidentally, was 9-11 because uh, we have a New York district office, which is one of our main offices for the EEOC. And at the time it was located in the World Trade Center complex. So uh, it, it was really a harrowing day for so many people. But ultimately after the Twin Towers fell, the New York district office also um, was destroyed. It was uh, located in one of the auxiliary buildings of the World Trade Center complex. So that created a whole a whole crisis communication situation because, of course, all of the media coverage because uh, it's a federal agency and uh, the building was destroyed. And to handle a crisis communications uh, issue. A number of things come into play and first of all and this this is involving anything not just natural disasters but number one is you have to identify and, and publicize the fact that there is a crisis now in the case of natural disasters or terrorist incidents or things of that nature the number one thing that you want to do first is account for all of the employees so that was the first fo focus. Were all the employees safe? Did they all get out in time? The answer was yes. So thank goodness for that. Um, everyone got out in time from the New York District Office before the building um, fell, um, after the World Trade Centers fell. Uh, and secondly, you need to put together a rapid response team to respond to all the public in inquiries, in particular from the media, and to, to, to try to stay ahead of the story. Um, and also it's important for, on an internal communications standpoint, to, to keep in touch with those affected, those affected employees, because you wanna try to boost morale and um, encourage them to the extent possible especially after they experience such, such, you know, a tremendous tragedy. So that, that effort uh, did go very well in so far as getting the message out that everyone was okay and uh, focusing on, on the employees. And then the question became, well, what happens to all the cases, all the discrimination cases that were pending in that, that New York district office? Um, because that affects the, the, the public, serving the public. So it moved to uh, setting up temporary offices, having the employees work where they could remotely to, to catch up, to um, recollect some of the information that was lost when the building was destroyed, 
and to try to relocate and, and get back to work on behalf of, of the taxpayers. So that's what we did. And in, in the course of all that it involved uh, regular communications with the news media, issuing press releases, uh, letting everyone know what was happening and, uh, you know, following through throughout the whole process. Um, you know, one thing that is difficult about these natural disasters or related incidents is that you need to put your personal emotions and feelings on the shelf. You need to put them aside and focus like a laser beam on the crisis. Now, um, I happen to be a native New Yorker, so this was very close to me. And I actually happened to lose a dear childhood friend who worked on in one of the, the World Trade Center towers above the 100th floor and did not make it out. So um, that is always a challenge to uh, mentally focus on the crisis and what you have to do for crisis communications and rapid response, while at the same time putting those strong emotions on, on the shelf temporarily or in a lockbox. So that, that is very challenging. Sure. Uh, yes. Yeah, so other than the New York District Office being destroyed, um, prior to that, you may recall the uh, the uh, federal building in Oklahoma City was destroyed um, in that domestic terrorist incident with Timothy McVeigh. And we had a, um, a local office there in Oklahoma City area office that was affected. Um, so that, that was another um, situation where we went through a similar process. But it's, it's all about um, getting the information out as quickly as possible for crisis communications. What you find a lot in the private sector is that companies stonewall, they're slow to react, they're slow to admit that there's a problem or a crisis, even though the news media is all over it. So they start out behind the eight ball, so to speak, from the beginning and, and hurt their credibility right off the bat. Because what you wanna do is be completely transparent get all the information out quickly, uh, hopefully all at one time, so there's no drip, drip, drip factor of stories, and then publicly admit uh, whatever the crisis is, it, especially if uh, the employer's at fault, which again, this is more for the private sector, and, and make a public apology and a public uh, statement you know, to, to the consumers or whoever uh, you know, your target audience is that, that um, this occurred, we take full responsibility and accountability for it, we're working to get all the information out and to move forward and correct whatever the problem or issue was. And then you need to follow through on those commitments with, with updates and proof. So that's what you really need to do. Now, from a government standpoint, it's a little different, especially when you're dealing um, with natural disasters. Another natural disaster at the EOC occurred when our New Orleans office was destroyed during Hurricane Katrina. But again, from the, the government standpoint, the playbook, so to speak, was the same. First, all employees must be accounted for, because that's the most important thing. You're talking about human lives here. And, and you need to convey that to the news media and then answer any other questions they might have and come up with a plan to move forward to keep the, the work going. Um, the, the public service on behalf of the taxpayer, you, need, you, can't, just, you can't just grind to a halt because of a natural disaster, you need to work around it. So you need to formulate a plan to do so and then keep the media and the public advised and informed of that plan. For instance, if, if an office is destroyed, how does the public get in touch with that office? How do they check on, let's say, cases that are pending or uh, you know, interviews or appointments they may have with EEO counselors at that office. 
So getting as much information out as quickly as possible is really the goal. And then to be um, accessible and available around the clock to the news media to keep that going. Because so I guess uh, we have colleagues in both Houston and the Florida area who will be, who are very busy right now. Oh yes, that's that is definitely true. I mean, I don't work at the EEOC anymore, but um, you know, we do have a big office in, in Houston and obviously other places across the country that were affected um, by hurricanes. You know, Irma, the latest hurricane, is also, as well as Hurricane Harvey. And uh, I'm sure behind the scenes, these rapid response and you know, crisis communications efforts are in place. Now, that's just one component of it from a public relations perspective. Because if you don't get all the information out and do it quickly, then you risk... Um, factual inaccuracies in the media and in today's 24-7 you know, uh, media environment where a story could go viral in a New York minute, so to speak, you need to get the information out first and get it out correctly before there's, there's any room for the media to, to get um, wrong or bad information out there. Because once there's information out there, especially today with, with the blogosphere, social media, the whole digital information age. The news spreads fast, and once it's out, it's tough to put the proverbial genie back in the bottle. So that's critically important, and it's something a lot of private sector employers get wrong because they don't want to admit a crisis, they stonewall, they're not responsive to the media, and that ends up being extremely detrimental uh, to the, the brand image of the employer as well as their public relations efforts and, and the confidence of their consumers, you know, or customer base. Well, I would agree with you, and I suspect that there are a lot of people who will be listening to this podcast who may reconsider their strategy and their approach, particularly some of the chemical industries that have been uh, in the news, uh, although they've tried not to be, <laughs> in this uh, hurricane season. I hope they'll be listening to you closely. <laughs> Well, you know, this is very important, you know, from a, par a public service perspective as, as well as you know, the implications it has on, on an employer and the, the brand loyalty that customers may have to the company. That could all disappear very quickly if um, the customers, the stakeholders, whoever your, your target audience is, if they lose trust. In, in the employer and its efforts during a crisis, well, it's very difficult to gain back that trust. Yes. And one, once it's lost, it, it, it's lost. And it, it may take a long time to regain it. Customers, consumers, stakeholders, you know, they move on and um, you know, put their allegiance to, to, uh, to you behind them if, if you really um, you know, mess it up, so to speak. And then they just move forward and, uh, you know, go to, go to competitors. So and that, that affects a company's profitability, affects its uh, you know, stock prices, all kinds of decisions within the company. So a lot of employers take this for granted and, you know, don't have crisis communications plans in place. So they're ready. God forbid a crisis breaks out. They're not playing catch up. They're not scrambling. They have a well coordinated plan in place. Everyone's on the same page and they move forward and implement it expeditiously. Well, that thank is key. You so much for making that point. It is key. And I'm again encouraging our listeners to pay attention and to make these kinds of efforts if you're in the private sector. And to and to all of those who are in the public sector working 
on this hurricane season, thank you for the service and the time that you put in. And thank you, David, for all that you've done and are doing uh, to make uh, this uh, improvements in communication in these times where it's so badly needed. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. And thank you, audience, for tuning in, for listening. And we hope that this makes a difference in how you approach crises in your world. Thanks again.